Welcome to the Talking Archive. I'm Josh Jacobs. It's an honor to be talking with a uh, legend in radio, Southern California, from San Bernardino to San Diego to Los Angeles. Ted Zingenbush, thanks for uh, being with us today. Oh, thank you, Josh. Nice to be here. Well, tell us what got you sparked, what sparked your interest to, to get into radio as a, as a child? Well, it, it pretty much started, uh, there was a station in my hometown of San Bernardino. I actually was born in Ohio, but we moved to uh, San Bernardino when I was about five years old. And so I basically went to school and grew up out there. And um, in 1962, on my birthday, March 10th of 1962, uh, one of the AM stations that had been playing basically, uh, you know, the pop standards of that time, um, everything from Henry Mancini to oh, whoever else was popular uh, for the older adults, it flipped to um, a top 40 station for younger people, uh, K-Men. It mm. was uh, K-Men 129, the AM station out there. And uh, the legendary Ron Jacobs consulted the station, and Bill Watson was their first program director. Bill later went on to uh, running Drake Chenault and working at KMPC as the program director and other things. But in 62, they started this little top 40 station, and it just skyrocketed uh, to the number one spot because it was so much fun to listen to. The personalities on the radio station, uh, there was a guy, Huckleberry Chuck Clemens did mornings, um, William F. Williams and, and Jim Mitchell uh, shared duties uh, around midday, afternoons was Bill Watson, Brian Lord did nights, and it was just a really fun radio station to listen to. And one time when I asked, I had Brian Lord on years later and asked him, uh, what he thought made the station so special. And he said, well, before the Beatles came along, music wasn't very good, <laughs> as you might recall. <laughs> you know, and, and he said, we, so we had to be really entertaining to get people to listen to the radio. And they did that. They would, I, I would say, uh, and I heard this quote from somebody that by the end of the week, they would have put on about a thousand phone callers to the radio station. So they did, you know, a little interaction. It wasn't really dedications necessarily, mm -hmm. but they would interact with the audience and just make it fun. And I thought, boy, how, how cool is this? And um, as, you know, you get sucked into uh, the energy and the excitement of something like that, as, as a 12-year-old kid, I uh, said, you know, I'm going to take a poll uh, I'm going to take a survey of people. I, I don't know what made me do that, but I called people at random out of the phone book and asked them their favorite radio station. And I kept doing it. And I asked somebody, I said, how many people do you think I need to call before I, I turn in my research here to the radio station and tell them what I did for them? And somebody said, well, I think you ought to call a thousand people. Mm -hmm. And so, as a 12-year-old, I don't know, I, I can't remember how many hang-ups I got, but I eventually, I got to the point where, um, you know, I finished this little poll and I called the radio station and Bill Watson uh, took the call and put me on the air and, you know, and after after we did a little short thing on the air, he says, can I get you to come down? Can you can you bring me that to the radio station? And I said, Well, yeah, I'll I'll have my parents, you know, bring me down there. And uh, they took me down there, and I took it in, you know, to give it to him. And he put me on the radio again. He asked me into the control room, and that was the first time I'd ever been, you know, in a radio control room. And um, that was exciting and. Uh, you know, it kind of sparked my interest even further. And they kind of let me hang around as a young kid. I was uh, an unpaid intern doing the odd jobs, you know, getting somebody coffee, going across the street, you know, getting getting them a sandwich if they were hungry or whatever. <laughs> it really was the gopher days, as they called them. And that's kind of how it all started. You know, I, I started just hanging around the station as an unpaid intern. 
And uh, tell us about the setup of the radio station back then, because I remember seeing pictures of top 40 stations here in Los Angeles, and you had an engineer playing the records, playing the commercials, and the DJ would just basically speak and read the copy. Uh, how similar was that setup in, in San Bernardino, Riverside? Well, we had a chief engineer that, you know, took care of the transmitter. He was he was there during the daytime, I would assume, mostly 9 to 5. Uh, but they didn't really have an engineer that ran the music for them. They ran their own shows. Mm. And so they sat in the control room in kind of a U-shaped um, desk where they would pull their chair in and the control panel would be in front of them where they would, you know, use the correct volume and turn on their microphone. And on each side of them was a turntable. Um, I think we had, well, we had three of them at that time uh, where they would, you know, queue up the vinyl records to play mm -hmm. and get the next one ready while the other one was playing. And they had tape machines that played the commercials. But they didn't really have any uh, assistance on doing their show. We used to say it's like being an air traffic controller because every three minutes without computers in those days, mm -hmm. uh, if you didn't do what you were supposed to do, all people heard was static on the, on the radio. So you had to really stay on top of things. And twice an hour, I think in those days, twice an hour at at 20 and 40, uh, they would go to the newsroom for headlines. And Lyle Kilgore uh, was one of the news uh, men in those days. He later went to KHJ in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. But um, that was about it. The, the DJ could look uh, through a, a big, large picture window. He could look into the newsroom and see his news guy. And he had a picture window into the transmitter. I don't know for what purpose because uh, you know <laughs> most of the most of the guys weren't allowed to touch anything but the records. Um, so engineers were like that, that back then. <laughs> yeah, and then they had a pegboard. Uh, I, I can't remember whose bright idea this was. I, several people claimed credit for it, mm -hmm. but they had a pegboard that was set up, and it was set up Monday through Friday and the weekends, and then each shift down the other side. And they would have a certain number of oldies but goodies, you know, the songs that uh, had been off the charts for a while. They would put them on the pegs, and your shift, you you had to play those oldies. You, you could occasionally dip out of somebody else's stack, but that was supposed to be uh, your oldie stack. Mm. And then they would rotate. They would... Uh, move everything to the right one notch or whatever they did so you didn't play the same stack day after day and eventually it would take several days for that stack of oldies to get back to your show and again being pre-computer before we had any kind of assistance with something like that that or three by five cards or whatever that's how they did the radio show and and uh, decided what was played that's great. I mean, I, I, I'm thinking myself, you know, right now, with, like you said, computers pretty much spitting it out. And oftentimes the computers seem to play the same song at the same time. And it's not as random as the way you're describing that situation. Um, how many, uh, how often did the DJs themselves get to break records on their own? Um, how much creative freedom did they have to debut a new album back then? I don't think they had a whole lot of freedom, although they did have a whole lot of input um, with, you know, the people running the station. If they had, by chance, uh, you know, gone to uh, some club somewhere and seen somebody, they would recommend, hey, you know, maybe we should uh, add this song. It seems like, you know, the young people really like it or it's getting really popular. And... Not as early as 62, but shortly thereafter, later into the 60s, there were a lot of bands in the Riverside, San Bernardino area that became popular. There was a group called the Good Feelings, and they did a song called I'm Captured that I think went all the way to number one on both uh, K-Men and KFXM, the two competing top 40 stations. Wow. And... 
then there was a group called the Bush, uh, B-U-S-H, that was popular. And they did a crazy kind of novelty song called Who Killed the Ice Cream Man? <laughs> and that became a local hit and went, you know, up the charts. Not sure, again, you know, probably several people would take credit today for <laughs> for the popularity of, of especially those two songs. Um, so the latter sounds like something you'd hear on the Dr. Demento show. Right, right. You know, and in the 60s, it was too early to know about Jimmy Webb, you know, who mm -hmm. went to Valley College and wrote, you know, so many of the classic songs, uh, like By the Time I Get to Phoenix and Up, Up and Away and all of that. But William F. Williams, who was a DJ at Cayman, um, he got this idea, uh, or the station got the idea, to get a hot air balloon and go to local locations around San Bernardino. And they, uh, they would, you know, have it tethered over the business, and it would draw a lot of attention from people driving by. And they would stop, and William F. would make an appearance and um, apparently, he collaborated at some point with Jim Webb and said, "You know, we ought to write a song." I think I think William F. Williams was working on a movie about a hot air balloon. He he also, being a very creative guy, would you know try to write movie scripts and ideas for TV shows and things like that. And uh, it one thing led to another, and uh, up came the song "Up, Up and Away." Uh, you know, in the Browns, what was it, 67? Yeah, the and, fifth dimension. Uh, the, yeah, and the Cayman balloon, you know, became kind of uh, the legendary uh, toy for the radio station, which is kind of funny because KFXM, their competitor, their logo was a tiger. They called it Tiger Radio, and they actually had a trained tiger that they would drag out to appearances, <laughs> uh, if you can believe that. Wow. With the, with the liabilities <laughs> and stuff, <laughs> like a zoo on wheels. <laughs> and so, you know, Cayman had a little cartoon guy called Bernard for San Bernardino. Mm. And so Bernard was their little cartoon character on the tune sheets, but they thought they kind of needed something, you know, to, to make them stand out. And so uh, the balloon became kind of uh, a draw for people. Uh, that shows you how bored we were in the mid-60s, that we'd show up at a hamburger place to look at a hot air balloon. But <laughs> <laughs> Now, what kind of uh, creature was Bernard? Yeah, I I'm not sure who came up with him. Mm -hmm. He looked like a little muscle man. Um, with, I think he had a discus in one of his hands, like he was a little Olympic guy. Um, but a lot of people never knew that he actually had a name because, you know, they didn't make a point of, of talking about him or anything. Oh. But when they promoted, when they started promoting the radio station on the old station, KITO was the call letters of the station that came and replaced and they kept saying in between songs, the Cayman are coming on 129, the Cayman are coming. And they ran ads in the local newspaper saying the Cayman are coming. And it was a, a teaser. Nobody knew, you know, who are these Cayman? <laughs> and so when it finally, when it finally happened, things happened. Uh, I mean, the, the success of the station was almost immediate. Back in those days, they, they had a couple of rating services, you know, that would let stations and advertisers know who was the most popular. And they had something called the Hooper ratings. And the Hooper would come out and you could see what percentage of people were listening to you. And at that time, it was just something ridiculous. Uh, out of all the stations that, you know, you could pick up out in San Bernardino, including FM, that wasn't that popular in those days, but... Um, came in uh, at one point early on, had like 45% of the listeners in the afternoon were listening to came in. So that's, that's, you know, when you've got almost half of the people in the city listening to you, if they've got the radio on, that was a huge success for them. Well, looking back on it all, what was it that drove and attracted such a large percentage of the audience to came in? I think they just 
um, sounded like somebody you'd like to meet. They would they would create theater of the mind. They would do a lot of uh, storytelling mm-hmm. in short spurts. I mean, this was. Uh, you know, three, four years before Boss Radio and the DJs not talking very much became popular at KHJ in Los Angeles. Um, so the guys had a little more liberty to talk about things and to talk about local events. And in those days, you know, in, out in San Bernardino, they would hold uh, teenage dances at the National Guard Armory and a few other little dance places. And so the guys would talk about that. And if you were 12 or 13 and you couldn't go to those because either your parents wouldn't let you or or there was an age limit of like 16 or 17, you know, you you uh, you felt like you wanted to be older than you were. That happened to us a lot. But uh, it was it was fun to hear these stories that they would tell. And then they got really involved with the community. And they would do, um, for the March of Dimes, they would walk all the way to Riverside and back and raise money along the way. You know, they'd carry buckets, and the, and the DJs would do the walking. And they would do, I was trying to remember, they would do a talk thon at Paris Hill Park. They would set up a trailer, and a guy would talk as long as he could to see, you know, how long they could compete against each other in like a little mini debate or something. And so they, they just started getting really involved with the community and doing projects. And then they started selling t-shirts and sweatshirts at the local department store. Harris's department store would sell, uh, came in, you know, memorabilia or souvenir stuff. And so it, it just really kind of, um, mushroomed or snowballed, into a much bigger deal and we we say when you look when you look back radio DJs were almost like movie stars in those days you know because you only saw them when they made special appearances here they were in their little building out in the middle of the cow pasture um doing their radio show and we could talk to them on the phone but they were kind of bigger than life Oh, yeah. And this is the uh, Talking Archive. My name is Josh Jacobs. We're talking with Ted Zingabush, and he's discussing the early days of Cayman 129 Radio, which was an Inland Empire top 40 powerhouse. 45% of the audience oftentimes was listening to Cayman alone. And uh, Ted, next time what we're going to do is we're going to delve even deeper into this and also ask, how did you eventually get on the air on Cayman? So uh, we look forward to having you on again. Well, thank you. Good to talk to you.